So uh, I mentioned briefly before the idea of counting your blessings. Uh, yeah, and counting your blessing is like a kind of gratitude exercise. Uh, remember all the good things in your life. Uh, it's so easy when life is going well to see all the bad things. Yeah, see the little things. Uh, and sometimes the better life is, uh, the more we kind of see the bad things, the little things that don't work out. Uh, and uh, so counting the blessings is very uh, is a very useful thing to do, to just to remember all the uh, the very fortunate things. And most of us we live quite fortunate existence. Yeah, we are all reasonably well off. We don't. No one here is starving. I hope anyone here is starving. Yeah. Anyone? Here? <laughs> everyone. <laughs> everyone is okay. And we have the Dhamma, and we are all reasonably well educated, and we have kind of so many things going for us in this world. Uh, and sometimes we need to remember those things. Uh, and that sense of memory will allow us to uh, not to be too fault-finding and too negative about the small things that go wrong. Uh, the small things that go wrong are inevitable. That is why human life sucks. And that is why we have to get out of this, out of this mess, yeah? because this is our opportunity to get out of this. Uh, many years ago, we had a um, Dhamma talk. Ashram Brahma gave a Dhamma talk uh, about samsara, how terrible it was. This was back in 1995. Uh, and then the title of the Dhamma talk was Sangsara Sucks, was that title of Dhamma talk yeah, that was given by uh, Bhanta Sujato, Sucks, S U X, yeah, Sucks. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if you remember, there was a band back in the 1970s called the Sex Pistols, uh, yeah, so that's kind of Sucks, the same, kind of, same kind of thing, yeah. So very, <laughs> so that was kind of, a, I think, a, a reference to that. I'm not sure, but I think maybe it was a reference to that. Yeah. Anyway, that's kind of beside the point. So, <laughs> so uh, this is a way of doing things. So having a sense of gratitude is uh, very, very useful. Uh, so let's just have a very quick look at what the uh, Buddha has to say about this. And a couple of very short suttas. Uh, this is from the uh, Anguttara Nikaya, uh, the Numerical Discourse 2, uh, sutta number 32. <clears throat> very, very brief. Uh, Monks, I will teach you the level of the untrue person and the level of the true person. Listen and apply your mind well. I will speak. So the uh, untrue person is the asapurisa, the true person is the sapurisa. And this is basically uh, equivalent to the areas. Yeah, true person can also be called the uh, superior person and the inferior person. That's another way of translating it. And so what are these inferior and superior people? Uh, yeah, listen and apply in your mind well. I will speak, as the Buddha says so often in the suttas. And the monks reply, what do they think they reply? No, maybe. They reply, yes, sir. Yes, sir, they replied. So usually the monks are okay. Usually they are well behaved. Sometimes they lose the plot a bit. But in this case, they are on the right track. And the Buddha says, what is the level of the untrue person? Level here means like the ground of the untrue person, like where the untrue person stands, if you like. Yeah, the kind of mental level, if you wish. Yeah, in that sense, yeah, Bhumi is the Pali word. And it's the same word as uh, Bhumi Putra that you have here in, uh, in Malaysia. It's actually the same word. Yeah, so the, uh, the Bhumi Putra, the kind of the indigenous, more indigenous people. I'm not sure if, that, if they really are indigenous, but anyway, that's what they, what they call themselves. So the Bhumi Putra. And uh, so this is the same kind of word here. The untrue person is ungrateful and thankless. For the wicked only know how to be ungrateful and thankless. It is totally the level of the untrue person to be ungrateful and thankless. So um, wicked, I think wicked here is uh, Papa, I think. I haven't actually looked it up, but I think usually that is Papa, the the, the wicked, same word as used for the Mara, when the Mara is considered bad or evil. Yeah, the wicked one. Sometimes it's a translation for Mara, Papima. And um, here we have the same thing here. Yeah. So uh, gratefulness and thankfulness. Yeah, if you don't have these things, you are on the wicked <laughs> level. And uh, so this is kind of uh, uh, unfortunate. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, of course, the opposite is also true, which is really nice. So here we go for the opposite. The true person is grateful and thankful. For the virtues only know how to be grateful and thankful. It is totally the level of the true person to be grateful and thankful. So if you are grateful and thankful, 
then you are kind of on the level of the noble ones. The noble ones always have a sense of gratitude and thankfulness in the way they live. Uh, and so you can see here, sometimes it's not that hard. Uh, a little bit of gratitude and you're already moving kind of in, in the circles uh, of the noble people, so to speak. Uh, and this is what you see here. Uh, so how, how can you be more grateful and thankful? Gratitude and thankfulness is, uh, of course, it starts with just... Uh, saying thank you or, or something like that. It begins with just showing one's gratitude. But that is not really enough. Yeah, the, the idea of being grateful and thankful is really a quality of the heart. It's how you feel in response to other people. That's kind of the most important thing. And so you want to move away, or you don't want to move away, but you want to add to the idea of showing your gratitude to also making it an emotional experience at the same time. Because that is when it's powerful. So you want to feel this gratitude yeah and how can you how can you feel gratitude yeah? how can you make this work for you huh? and very often you have to see the good qualities in the person who is supporting you the person who is giving you something the person who is uh, there to guide you in the right way or whatever it might be when you see where it is coming from the intention the good intention the kindness or whatever that is when you feel the sense of gratitude yeah? If you don't see the good intention, if you just take it, you just kind of grab it and kind of you know, think it is your right and you are entitled to this or whatever, then of course you won't feel anything as a consequence. So uh, this is why it is useful to reflect on the Buddha, to understand who the Buddha actually is, uh, to understand that the Buddha is acting purely out of compassion, uh, that the Buddha doesn't have any vested interest, uh, the Buddha doesn't really care if we are his disciples or not. Uh, the Buddha is not doing this so that he can have a meal the next day. He will get that meal regardless. Uh, yeah, the Pacheka Buddhas who never teach anything, they can still eat uh, because people will still support them. Uh, and they become a merit, field of merit for the world, even if they don't teach. Uh, and so the Buddha goes out of his way. He's willing to incur extra suffering uh, so that he can teach us. Uh, this is how far he will go, yeah, just to be able to teach. Uh, he does it purely out of compassion. Uh, that's kind of very beautiful very powerful way of thinking about the Buddha. And uh, then you start to, you know, when you think of it like that, it becomes very nice. Or you can, you know, as I mentioned yesterday, you think of someone in your life who has been very kind to you and supported you, like an auntie or a grandparent or an uncle or whoever it is, and maybe a nice teacher or whatever it is. And when they are kind to you, usually you feel a sense of gratitude, yeah, because you, you have this close relationship to them. You have a sense of heart connection with this other person. And then you feel that gratitude arising and because of that uh, thing. And when your parents do something kind for you, uh, you don't feel anything at all. Yeah? You're kind of just neutral, uh, sometimes anyway. Uh, is that true? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Depends on the situation. Because sometimes the relationship with the parents is more complicated. Uh, and sometimes you don't necessarily feel that. Uh, but sometimes you do. Uh, sometimes actually, it is true, when I think back what some of my parents did, but sometimes actually do, you do feel a sense of gratitude. You're surprised when they do something extra for you or something special. So it uh, depends on the circumstances. So very short sutta on gratitude and thankfulness. And of course, you can bring this into your meditation as well. Yeah? Because in your meditation, you, uh, you can have a sense of... I mean, even these contemplations of the Buddha Dhamma are almost like... Gratitude and thankfulness contemplation is in a certain way, but you can also just do it more generally. Yeah? The gratitude of being able to go on a retreat or to hang out and to meditate for a while. Uh, the gratitude to the, to the BGF for having this place, other yeah, places here, all the people who stand behind this, who have built this up over the decades or whatever. Uh, the gratitude for the long lineage of teachers and Buddhists that kept this alive over the centuries and millennia. The gratitude to, you know, the, um, the Sangha, maybe, who's still out there doing his best to practice and teach these things. Uh, the gratitude to all the Kalanamittas, the gratitude to the people who are organizing these things, yeah, like Bobby and Lai and, and, all those, and everyone else who is organizing these things. Uh, so there's so many found bases for gratitude. Uh, the gratitude for all the beautiful food that we get. People bring food every day. Uh, it's kind of marvelous and wonderful yeah, coming, coming in here. And uh, it's uh, amazing kind of what, how much effort people sometimes go to to be supportive and to help out. Uh, and uh, so that's kind of remarkable. There's lots of basis for gratitude. Uh, 
when you're part of this sort of Buddhist community. And all you have to do it is to kind of, uh, kind of turn your mind in that direction uh, and you will be able to see what is going on there. Then the kind of the feeling arises as a consequence. All right, another short little sutta on gratitude. This is called The Ungrateful. And Guttara Nikaya, numerical discourses four, is number 213. So what happens if you are really ungrateful is not good. And this is what this shows. Mendicant, someone with four qualities, is cast down to hell. What for? It's kind of interesting, the idea of being cast down. Yeah, Nikita, I mean like chucked into hell. Yeah, like you are, it's not very nice. And the, the guardians just grab you by the legs and arms and throw you into the hell. And no, please don't throw me into hell. I don't want to be here. Ha, no choice. Bang, into hell you go. Yeah, this is the thing. <laughs> That, that you don't, no one has any mercy for you if you are going to hell. They're not going to listen to your pleas. No, 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 please don't throw me. But didn't you do bad acts? I didn't understand. You should have understood. Bang, into hell you go. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is almost what it is like. There's a sutta that talks about this, yeah? how the guardians of hell kind of interrogate you. And actually, it is you, it is you, you are interrogating yourself yeah? because you have this life review and these kind of things. And then you judge yourself and this kind of bang, and you kind of throw yourself into hell in a sense. The idea of being cast down, yeah, this has this idea that the, the kamma often works really fast if you have done some really bad actions. Just like the kamma works really fast in being reborn in the Brahma Loka, if you practice samadhi and jhanas, bang, you go straight to the Brahma Loka. Because you kind of, as you die in the process, you enter that jhanas and you go to those... Uh, you go straight there. But hell realm is kind of similar. If you have done many bad things, you go straight to hell. So what are these four bad things? Don't look. <laughs> Always think first, yeah? This is one of the things I would really recommend you to do. If you look first, your, your, your ability to kind of think independently goes out. Never look first. Never look. Always think first. Okay, the Buddha says there's four things. I wonder what they are, yeah? This kind of trains you to tune into the Dhamma. If you always look first, you never, it's actually you learn much less that way. Always reflect first. Hmm, I wonder what's going on here. That actually is a much very powerful way of, uh, of uh, learning the Dhamma in a sense. So what for? Yeah? So most of you know already, but anyway. I'll <laughs> so what for? Bad conduct by body, speech, and mind. Yeah, and being ungrateful and thankless. Someone with these four qualities is cast down to hell. So it is not enough, fortunately, just to be ungrateful. It's not sufficient because uh, sometimes many people would go to hell if that was the case. But uh, if you're kind of thoroughly bad conduct by body, speech, and mind, uh, and you are ungrateful and thankless, uh, then these things go to get them. Then you go to hell. And of course, very often these things go together. If you are a person who has bad conduct by body, speech, and mind, you tend not to be grateful. These things often go together. Whereas a person who is virtuous will tend to be grateful. It's like good qualities tend to come together in a lump, in a sense. Yeah, they're all they're kind of a part and parcel of a kind of broader idea of wholesomeness. And that's why it is often phrased in this particular way. So if you have a good uh, conduct by body, speech, and mind, you are very likely also to be grateful. So uh, someone with four qualities is raised up to heaven. What for? Good conduct by way of body, speech, and mind, and being grateful and thankful. Someone with these four qualities is raised up to heaven. So I would recommend you to go to heaven rather than to hell. <laughs> I don't know if you need that recommendation. In case you need it, I will give it hereby. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, sometimes it's interesting how we, uh, you know, you can become like an intellectual Buddhist uh, and you can think that, oh, I don't want to deal with all this heaven and hell stuff. Uh, but uh, the problem is that uh, even here in the human realm, we have like little heavens and little hells. Uh, yeah? Some people live in really difficult stray. They have a really difficult time. They don't have any money. They have bad health, they have bad no education, all of these kind of things, they may be handicapped. And other people have all the good things. 
And usually the kind of the educated uh, good people, they become snobbish about these things. They say, oh yeah, I don't know this heaven hell stuff, but would they want to live like the worst people in the world? Of course not. Uh, and so of course, we actually, when it comes to reality, we would, everyone would rather be reborn in heaven and kind of hang out with uh, you know, other good people and have a good time rather than being reborn in the place where they're just suffering all the time. Uh, it's just bad, uh, it's just kind of terrible. Uh, and uh, so it should be, uh, you know, these things are not, uh, we shouldn't be too kind of snobbish or too uh, sophisticated to think that these things matter. They do matter. It is, these things are important. And sometimes you hear people saying things, yeah, all this happiness stuff, yeah, it's kind of just, uh, you know, why do people worry so much about happiness? But of course, happiness is incredibly important in life. And not only is it important, but it's also the way we define happiness matters enormously. Happiness is defined sometimes simply as the absence of pain. That is a kind of happiness. Happiness is also can be defined very broadly as things like contentment yeah, and uh, all of these other good qualities. And so it is anything that is, uh, is desired is really a kind of happiness because that's where we want to go, that's where we desire. And for that reason, it is a, a certain way of defining happiness. So, uh, now you know the way to heaven. Yeah, you probably knew it already, but now you know even you know an extra factor in how to go to heaven. Have gratitude and be thankful. So uh, that is a little bit about uh, just a little tiny little bit about uh, gratitude. And uh, so again, all of these things are useful little things on this path. So now, what comes next? What comes next is the Kakach Upama Sutta, the simile of the soul. And uh, the reason why I want to look at this, because we are looking at the idea of uh, developing good qualities. And the Kakach Upama Sutta is really about how to develop metta and also to a lesser extent compassion. And this is what this uh, Sutta is about. And uh, it has some interesting aspects to it. And uh, this time we have. Uh, Time we have that the whole sutta is in there, so we're going to have a look at the whole sutta. I think I can't remember now. I think the whole sutta is in there. We will see as we go along here. And uh, so uh, this is the simile of the soul. The, sim the actual simile of the soul comes at the very end. I did mention it very briefly before, but now we will see all the things that lead up to that simile here. So now I'm going to take Wayne's uh, nicely um, done, uh, nicely done, what do you call it, the sutta thingy. So here it is. And uh, I think maybe this one here. Ah, it's better. Let me expand. It's quite nice. Can you see that? Yeah, okay, good. So because otherwise, it's quite a long sutta, we can't really do a line by line. So we're going to go a little bit, a uh, little bit faster here. Yeah. So this is found in the middle length sayings of the Buddha, Kakach Upama Sutta, the simile of the soul, Majjhimanika 28, uh, just before the uh, sutta called the Alagad Upama Sutta, which is another beautiful sutta. Um, hmm. Yes, Alagad Upama is a simile of the snake, and you will probably know that sutta uh, fairly well. It's a nice sutta. Anyway, so uh, let's have a look at what this is about. Uh, so um, I will just kind of read slowly through it, uh, and then we will pause at intervals as usual and discuss the, uh, some of the content. Um, so, uh, so I have heard at one time the Buddha was staying near Savati in Jaita's Grove and at the Pindika's monastery. Now at that time, Venerable Paguna of the top, top knot, his name was Molia Paguna, as a Pali word, so he has called it over the top knot, okay, was mixing too closely together with the nuns, the bhikkhunis, so much so that if any mendicant criticized those nuns in the presence, in his presence, Paguna of the top knot got angry and upset and even instigated disciplinary proceedings. And if any mendicants criticized Paguna of the top knot in the presence, in their presence, those nuns got angry and upset and even instigated disciplinary proceedings. 
That is how much Paguna of the top knot was mixing too closely together with the nuns. So uh, the idea here is just the general sense that if you get very close to somebody and you kind of build up a bond with someone of whatever kind, yeah, attachment of some sort, uh, then you get angry if someone else criticizes that person. Uh, yeah, you, you know what I mean? Anytime when you, there's someone you really like uh, and someone else criticizes that person, probably you might get a bit upset, yeah, because they shouldn't criticize that person. Uh, that's usually how it is. Uh, so uh, please don't criticize Ajahn Brahm to me. <laughs> we'll, Will I get upset if you do that? I pro I probably not, actually. I probably won't get all that upset. Why not? Because uh, pe I know what people are like. Yeah, people criticize. It's okay. If you criticize Jan Brahm, it's all right. You can do that. Uh, will I take it seriously? Maybe not. But anyway, you can still criticize me if you wish. Uh. <laughs> There's no point in being, uh, being upset because people criticize. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, so, uh, But anyway, that's usually how people are, right? Uh, and so you can see here that he's getting too close to the nuns because basically getting it as attachment, a bond forming there. And mon monks forming bonds with nuns, not usually a very good idea. That down the track that can lead to problems uh, and sometimes it leads to disrobing. And this is exactly what happens in the case of Paguna, the top knot, uh, eventually he disrobes and he is no longer a monk. Uh, and uh, maybe because he got too close to uh, the nuns uh, or maybe one nun in particular or whatever. Uh, uh, so this is uh, what is going on there, and uh, in instigating disciplinary proceedings, uh, well, this is uh, what happens. This is called the adhikarana in Pali, and this means that if someone uh, accuses someone else, this is called the disciplinary proceeding. Yeah, you make accusations, and then there is a certain process the sangha has to go through to sort out those accusations to find out if they are true or not, uh, and uh, then come to some kind of conclusion based on the. Uh, those accusations. So, yeah, so this is what happens. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, the Sangha does not really like disciplinary proceedings because it kind of just uh, adds to problems for everyone. Here. Mm. This is amazing. Look at all those drinks I have. Isn't that kind of extraordinary? <laughs> <laughs> this is remarkable. That's, uh, that is generosity for you. So uh, I cannot promise that I will be able to drink every single one of them, but we will, we will see, see what happens as we go through it. <laughs> so, um, okay. Then a mendicant went up to the Buddha, sat down to one side and told him what was going on. So the Buddha addressed a certain monk. Please, monk, in my name, tell the mendicant Paguna of the top knot that the teacher summons him. Yes, sir, that monk replied. He went to Paguna and said, Reverend Paguna, the teacher summons you. And uh, I don't know how you would feel if the Buddha summons you. You might feel a bit nervous if that was the case. You can imagine that the Buddha summons you. You probably know that you've been doing things that are a bit dodgy. And because you know that, you kind of feel slightly... Slightly, yeah, okay, we'll just have to take what happens. But of course, the reality is, and this is where, what, what is so beautiful about the Buddha is that when the Buddha summons you, even if he is going to give you a very light telling off and lightly um, pointing you in the right direction, you know, really, it is at the end of the day, it is out of compassion. Yeah? It is to support you. The Buddha never gets angry. The Buddha will never use loud language or harsh language. And so that is why it is so easy to listen to someone who has your, uh, your, uh, uh, your well-being at heart. Yeah? You get the feeling that they have your well-being at heart, so you're able to listen. You might feel a little bit nervous, uh, but then actually it is not really an issue. Uh, and it's nice to be told off in that way because you, uh, it opens up your mind when people do these things in the right way. So remember that because that will be the same thing for you yeah? if you tell someone off. Uh, if the other person feels that you have their best interest at heart uh, and you speak with compassion, then there is a chance they will listen to uh. So, uh, yes, Reverend Paguna replied. He went to the Buddha, bowed and sat down to one side. The Buddha said to him, is it really true, Paguna, that you've been mixing overly closely together with the nuns? So much so that if any mendicant criticizes those nuns in your presence, you get angry and upset and even instigate disciplinary proceedings. And if any mendicant criticizes you in those nuns' presence, 
they get angry and upset and even instigate disciplinary proceedings. Is that how much you've been mixing overly closely together with the nuns? Yes, sir. And then the Buddha says, Panguna, are you not a gentleman who has gone forward from lay life to homelessness? Hmm. Gentlemen. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. He says, as such, it is not appropriate for you to mix so closely with the nuns. So if anyone criticizes those nuns in your presence, you should give up any desires or thoughts of the lay life. If that happens, you should train like this. My mind will be unaffected. I will blurt out no bad words. I will remain full of compassion with a heart of love and no secret hate. That is how you should train. So now you can see the beginning here, why the sutta is about metta and loving kindness. Yeah? So if anyone criticizes anyone, you should never get angry with that person just because they criticize someone you like or someone you are close to. Yeah? This is not really the right response. And um, so you can see here, first of all, give up any desire and thoughts of the lay life. So obviously he was here getting attached. This is kind of obviously what is going on here, some sort of attachment to those nuns. And it's not really appropriate as a monk yeah, to, to do that uh, because it just leads in the wrong direction. Uh, and uh, so you give that up and you should train like this. My mind will be unaffected. Uh, I will blurt out no bad words. Uh, I will have um, remain full of compassion. Uh, and so you can see in your mind, this is a, actually a very nice way to see whether you have attachment to somebody. Uh, how do you feel if someone you're close to gets criticized? Uh, yeah? And I think in lay life, it's kind of very difficult maybe to avoid this because this is kind of what lay life is about. It's about having close bonds to other people. This is what family life often is, is about. So it's very hard in lay life to kind of do this fully. Yeah? But uh, it is still an ideal to be kind of moved towards. Yeah? Okay, so they criticize you know, my wife or my husband or my kids or whatever. Yeah? Maybe I shouldn't take that so seriously. Yeah? There's always going to be criticism in life. No one is perfect. Things are just going to come and it's going to go. This is the way things are. And then instead you have compassion and kindness for everyone around, including, of course, the person who criticizes. Yeah? They are just doing what they think is right. Maybe they are misguided, maybe not. Listen to the words. If what they're saying is nonsense, just discard it. Don't worry about it. But maybe what they're saying is a grain of truth. And if someone criticizes out of compassion, if someone criticizes having your well-being at heart, there may well be a grain of truth to it. And sometimes we can learn from other people's criticism. That's a good thing. Yeah. So open up, listen, and be kind of just be wise about it. And most of the time we can chuck out criticism because most of the time criticism just comes from a stupid place. People need to vent and they are upset or whatever. But sometimes they bring out a little treasure, a treasure of criticism, pointing out a flaw you may never have seen before. And then it opens up new avenues for practicing the Dhamma, overcoming defilements, abandoning the unwholesome, things you may never have seen unless someone points it out. Often we are blind to our own faults because we are too close to them. It can be really hard to see your own faults. Yeah? And often we don't want to see it. Often we deny our own faults because it's just too painful to accept. Yeah? We have enough criticism as it is in life. We don't need to criticize ourselves. And so we don't really want to see them. But sometimes it can be really, really helpful. And then we can become an even better person as a consequence. So this is what is going on here. So my mind will remain unaffected. Yeah? No bad words shall emerge. I will remain full of compassion with a heart full of metta. Uh, the um, metta cheto imutti, whatever it is. Uh, and no uh, secret or inner hate. Uh, that is how you should train. Okay, that's a nice start for the sutta. So let's uh, do some meditation. Mm -hmm. Okay, any uh, comments or questions or uh, anything else? Uh, yeah, please. Thank you so much, Ajahn, for putting these suttas side by side. Um, 
please correct my view. I'm trying to understand uh, the two suttas, the, the earlier suttas and this one. Um, um, the question is really, is feelings all right? Because obviously the, the, um, the earlier suttas about generosity, about um, gratefulness, um, the whole idea is to bring up the energy to bring you towards joy. Hmm. And um, you need to go through this path with those kinds of feelings. But later on, you may find that you get attached to those people you give, you are grateful to, or you are you know, being generous to, or you are associated with. And um, then you learn to then, uh, you know, detach yourself from them by training this way and um, by, by the meta uh, concept of, of there's really no division uh, amongst all sentient beings. Um, am I in the right track or am I yeah, yeah, out I think of so. it? I, th I think so. You, I mean, you don't have to be attached just because you have gratitude, you know. I mean, maybe, maybe it can happen in certain cases, but you can have gratitude towards like a, a stranger on the street. A stranger on the street says something nice to you. You think, oh, <laughs> that doesn't mean you get attached to the stranger on the street. So uh, you, uh, you know, it's not necessarily go, go together. Gratitude can be a very pure feeling of just, you know, towards anyone, someone who is a bit far away, like someone who is not very close to you or whatever as well. Huh? So, uh, but even if it does lead to a little bit of attachment, that's okay. It's still important. Uh, important thing to have yeah and then you deal with that attachment uh, one of the things about the uh, buddhist path it is like it's almost like a hierarchy of attachments in a sense uh, and if you don't attach to something higher up well then you will attach to something lower down so if by attaching to something high you can let go of the bad things uh, so if you attach a little bit to a uh, uh, you know to um, uh, good qualities uh, then that is a positive thing yeah. attaching to people not such a good idea, but it's unavoidable. We will be a little bit attached to some people, yeah? So to attach to the, better to be attached to kind people than to bad people. Huh? So, uh, yeah, so I would say basically on the right track, yeah. you have those feelings, if they lead to a bit of attachment, then so be it, and then you deal with that attachment uh, as you go along the path, uh, yeah, as you practice. Uh, usually the attachments tend to kind of wear away on their own. Uh, because uh, when you practice the Noble Eightfold Path, you become more independent, you become more resilient as a person. Uh, and that actually reduces the attachment to people, simply because you are building up good qualities within. Uh, so you don't actually have to try very hard, because sometimes it's difficult to, to do it. You, can, you can't just, you know, how can you just detach? It's, you know, sometimes that's impossible, but it happens through the practice of the path anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Venerable Ajahn. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to understand a bit better. Could you clarify more in terms of what is good or bad conduct by way of mind? Yeah. Or, but, or what does it mean? But it means that uh, you are angry. Angry is bad conduct by mind. Uh, excessive greed is bad conduct by mind. Uh, yeah. So all of these defiled mental states uh, are is bad conduct by mind. Effectively, the two most important ones are uh, greed and anger are the two most important bad conducts by mind. Uh, you could, if you wanted to, you could, can uh, also expand that to the five hindrances, but uh, basically the two most important of the five hindrances are anger and uh, excessive desires. Uh, those are the two areas. Uh, and of the anger and excessive desires, the most important one is anger. Ill will is the most problematic of all mental uh, conduct and emotions because it leads to enormous suffering for yourself and for people around you and it's lots of bad karma and it has all kind of negative effects so if you're going to deal with anything deal with the ill will and negativity or whatever yeah okay Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my question would be on how do we balance um, reverence for the Sangha yeah. as well as, uh, sorry, how do we balance reverence for the Sangha and the need to occasionally um, exercise some like scrutiny or like. Yeah. 
constructive skepticism <laughs> without exactly. going too far. Because yeah, yeah, if we were yeah. to be wrong about certain um, skeptical doubts that we have, then it would be quite comically disastrous as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I see what you mean. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Uh, um, uh, remember, the Sangha here is what I mentioned before. It's more like an abstract thing. Yeah, yeah. It's the Aryan Sangha. So the Aryan Sangha is uh, because you don't know who they are. Uh, they are, by definition, always pure. Yeah, because they are they are the Aryan Sangha. And so, what we should be careful with is kind of attaching too much to individuals, but uh, to the Sangha as a Nadea or an abstract concept. Uh, actually, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why it's hard to understand what the Sangha even means in that sense. And that's why one of the reasons why the uh, uh, instruction to Nandiya was not to contemplate the Sangha, but to contemplate the Kalinamitta. Because that is easy to understand what it is. Uh, and the Sangha as an idea is really only fully accessible by uh, Aryans. Uh, but if you think about the Sangha, so it, but Sangha is also like the monastic Sangha in general. Uh, and uh, of course, in that case, it is very important to you know to be to have some judgment, yeah, because uh, yeah, there will be just like among lay people and the sangha as well, there will be some good and some bad, uh, and some uh, you know some who practice well, some who don't practice so well. So don't be afraid of uh, you know of using your judgment. But also be humble at the same time. Know the limits of your judgment. Uh, so if you see something dodgy, okay, take a step back. Yeah. And then later on, you may find that you were too judgmental. Okay, then just take a step forward again. Yeah, so you just uh, you are really be careful like that. Uh, so you trust your judgment, but you also know the limitations of your judgment. Uh, then you're kind of on the on the right track. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, Ajahn. But yeah. how do I convince, let's say, another person to be more, you know, um, to to understand the limitations of their their judgment, and sort yeah. of like yeah, because by nature, perhaps the other person is. Uh, quite skeptical, very you know, cautious and all. Yeah. But not not without uh, good reasons though. Yeah. So. Okay. How yeah. I well, convince the other person. Yeah. Well, let's just convince them. Let's remind them that we, you know we're all fallible. You know we all make mistakes. You never really know hundred percent. Things are always uncertain. Uh, you know everyone makes errors of judgment all the time. You know, especially when it comes to other people. Uh, you know we judge people too harshly or whatever. Uh, and so we, uh, and so we just become more in. General, that's kind of an act of generosity as well, not to judge people too harshly. It's a kind of kindness to other people. Okay, I will leave the door open to you. Huh? And um, uh, yeah, even people who are, um, you know, very bad people in the world, uh, you um, uh, sometimes you just know that even bad people can change over time. Huh? And so you give them that opportunity. If you judge them too harshly, it's like I put you in a box forever after. And you can never come out of that box. You're in the box labeled evil, right? and that's the way you will stay. Yeah? But then maybe they change. Maybe they become a better person. Right? And so by not judging people too harshly, we're giving them the opportunity to change uh, and to kind of come out of that box and move into the box, the good box instead. Uh, and that's an act of kindness and act of generosity to, to everyone. Right? Yeah. Thank you very much, Ajahn. To remind us to always look at the potential for everyone yeah. to transform, to change. Yeah, yeah. that's you, part Ajahn. of it. Yeah.